Thank you, Patty, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Emma, for getting all this stuff going. Thank you to the Center of American History, National State History Day, and everybody who's involved in getting me here. And I, I feel that this is a little bit of a homecoming for me, not that I'm from Colorado, although I have a sister who has lived in Rifle, Colorado for the last 35 years. So I've been to Colorado many times. But it's a bit of a homecoming for me as a historian because I have written sporadically about it, the history of the West. But my first interest in history was the history of the West. I grew up in Portland. And my father had an interest in history. He had a kind of a double-barreled interest in history. One part, he was, uh, during World War II, he was a member of the US Army Corps of Engineers. And he felt personally responsible for all the great public works on the Columbia River. So we visited Bonneville Dam and the other big things that, that happened on the Corps of Engineers watch. But he also had an interest in the Lewis and Clark expedition. And so I will pose to you a question that my father posed to me relating to the Lewis and Clark expedition. So you know the story about how they went up the Missouri River and across the Rocky Mountains and down the Snake River and down the Columbia. And they knew that they were heading downstream and they were heading for the, the Pacific, but they didn't know how far from the Pacific they were. There was one evening where they pitched camp uh, a little bit above where Bonneville Dam is located today. And there's a, a very large basalt plug it's called Beacon Rock. It's still there, and I've hiked to the top of Beacon Rock. But the story goes that when the Corps of Discoveries, it was called, made their camp that night, they pulled the canoes up on the shore, as they did, and they made their dinner, and they all went to sleep. And the next morning, they woke up, and the canoes were gone. And they burst out in cheering. Why? Why did they celebrate the fact that the canoes were gone? Exactly. They had reached tidewater. They knew they were close enough to the ocean that the tide had stolen their canoes. They found the canoes, and they made their way. So this was one of my first historical puzzles. As I grew older, I had a closer connection to a different part of the history of the West. My grandparents bought a summer house on the Barlow Road. The Barlow Road was one of those last sections of the Oregon Trail. The most dangerous part of the Oregon Trail was not getting across the Great Plains, was not getting across the Rocky Mountains. In fact, the Rocky Mountains were a piece of cake because they went through South Pass, which is hardly a pass at all. The getting across the, the plains of the Snake River Valley, yeah, that was a challenge. But you know the hardest part, you know the most dangerous part? in terms of the number of pioneers, immigrants who died. It was a stretch, the last 100 miles, going down the Columbia River. Because, well, the Columbia River didn't have dams on it the way it does now. And there were rapids, the Cascades, where now Cas Cascade Locks is located, and the Dalles, which was a narrow chute. And so people would, the men, women, the children, they would survive the plains, they would survive the mountains, they would survive everything. And then they would drown when their, the rafts that they put their stuff on tipped over. And so somebody had to come up with a better way of making those last 100 miles. And a guy named Sam Barlow decided to build a road around the south side of Mount Hood. And it came around the south side of Mount Hood and it came down along what is now highway, US Highway 26. And my grandparents had a house that was right on <coughs> Highway 26. The property ran right up to Highway 26. And so I and my younger brother and my older sisters, we used to play pioneers. And we would go through the woods along the old Oregon Trail. And there was one particular aspect of the Oregon Trail that we found very intriguing. If we went up the, along the, the Barlow Road, there we took a hike off the road. And about a half mile off the road, there was a rock cairn that was maybe sort of this high off the ground, just a pile of rocks. And it was discovered when the highway was being rerouted that this was the grave of one of the emigrants. And so somebody put up a sign, the Pioneer Woman's Grave. And so I was a kid around the early 1960s. And at that point, and in fact and still today, no one has any idea who she was. But it really intrigued me. It almost haunted me 
that there was this woman, a presumably a relatively young woman, who had made it across the plains, across the mountains, had made 1,800 miles of the 2,000-mile journey, and then within almost sort of shouting distance of the goal in the Willamette Valley, she dies. And it was testament to the hurry that everybody was in that she was just buried in this shallow grave. They just dug a little bit of a hole and piled a bunch of rocks on top of it. And no one ever came back, apparently, to claim the body. No one came back to put up a sign saying who this was. So it was this great mystery. And I always wondered what had happened to her. Now, when I was sort of experienced all this stuff, I had no idea that I would ever write Western history. And as I say, I haven't written much Western history, although I've I got a book on the history of the West that's in progress, and it'll be out sometime. Um, but this gives me a chance to, well, coming here gives me a chance to talk about some of the history of the West, but in particular, its connection to another aspect of history that I have been studying for a bit longer, and that is the emergence of democracy in the United States. And I have come to the conclusion that it's impossible in American history to separate the emergence, sort of the rise of the West, with from the, you can't separate them from the emergence of democracy, in part because the formative years of, in the development of both, they overlap in American history. This effectively coincide. So it's, it's natural that there should be connection to, b between them. But the connections are actually deeper than that. They're not simply chronological connections. They're not simply correlation. They're causal connections, which I'm going to explain. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the, the argument that sort of the, the, two, the two most important, the two most formative aspects of American history were the westward expansion of the 13 original colonies and then states. The fact that this republic, and it was a republic from its birth, became a continent-wide republic. So not exactly a continental republic, the way some people thought it would be in the 19th century, but it spans from coast to coast. So the process of westering, of claiming this western territory, and then bringing it into the Union, this is one of the two most important developments in American history. And the other one was the emergence of American democracy. This country was not born a democracy, but it became a democracy. And it became a democracy about the time it became this continental republic. So this is the story that I'm going to tell. And I'm going to start by by pointing out that, well, the obvious thing, that the country, what would become the United States, emerged politically as this string of colonies and then states that clung to the eastern seaboard of North America, so the Atlantic coast. The United States had western property rights, western footage, from the end of the Revolutionary War, because the British, almost as a gift, to the Americans, ceded their claim to the title of the original American West, the land beyond the mountains, that is, beyond the Appalachian Mountains. The actually inhabited part of the United States went from the Atlantic to roughly the crest of the Appalachians. But the British threw in the eastern half of the Mississippi Valley, the part to the Mississippi River, as kind of a consolation prize at the end of the Revolutionary War. They didn't have to. The United States had not conquered that in the Revolutionary War, but the British reckoned that it wasn't going to do them any good, and it would probably simply cause friction with the United States. So at the Treaty of Paris in 1783, the British included this, well, basically doubled the size of the American Republic. And this is a big story because this doubling of American territory was, would ha is going to happen again and again. So in terms of American history, the most striking thing about American history from, we'll start with 1783, to 18, hmm, I could say 1848. Yeah, I'll stop at 1848. There is this progressive doubling of the size of American territory. And it always goes out to the West. Now, I'm going to ask you why there was such concern 
at that time in American history with expanding American territory. Why did Americans believe that they needed more territory? I'll ask you why. And, okay, yes. Well, there certainly was that. There was a feeling that if we don't get it, somebody else will. And that, that played a part. But, pardon? The British and the Spanish expansion. The British and the Spanish, yes, they had laid claim, although that argument maybe weakens over time because it was clear that the Spanish Empire was contracting. So Spain wasn't going to be claiming any more territory. The British, maybe, the United States, had a diplomatic tussle with the British over the Oregon Territory. But once the British had been thrown out of the major part of North America, they weren't a challenge so much. I mean, actually, I'll, I'll sharpen the question a little bit. Why this great demand for more territory, and this is the origin of the West, and why does it stop all of a sudden in the middle of the 19th century? Americans seem to have this insatiable appetite for more land, and then all of a sudden they lose their appetite. Yes? That was the Jeffersonian ideal because that was the reality. It was a nation of farmers. And if it's a nation of farmers, if, you're gonna, if your population is going to grow, you need more land. Benjamin Franklin was the first American to quantify this. As early as the 1750s, Franklin did a bit of a demographic study, and he, he gathered such sort of population statistics as he could find. And he concluded that the American population doubled about every generation. And in a nation of farmers, if you're going to double your population every generation, you pretty much have to double your land area every generation, or else face the increasing impoverization of your population. Americans looked at Europe, because of course most Americans were from Europe, and they asked themselves, well, what's the difference between Europe and the United States? And the biggest difference was, in America, you could get land. Ordinary people could get land. Why? Because there was more land than there were people. But if that land somehow gets more crowded, then the U.S. is going to look more and more like Europe. And that was the nightmare of all Americans. So there was this, well, so the American domain doubles in 1783, when the U.S. gets the eastern half of the Mississippi Valley. It doubles again with the Louisiana Purchase, the purchase from France of the western half of the Louisiana Valley, of uh, the Mississippi Valley. It, it doesn't quite double again, but nearly, with the acquisition of California and New Mexico and Arizona, about the same time as the acquisition of Oregon. And so that takes us up to, well, right around 1850. And that's it. That's it. I will allow for the acquisition of Alaska. But that's almost the exception that proves the rule. Why did it stop all of a sudden? Industrialization. Industrialization. Because the whole point of getting land was not land for land's sake. It was land for opportunity's sake. Land was for, well, the modern equivalent of jobs. What does government, what do local governments boast of? Why, you know, why are why are cities really happy when they land a big new factory? Or they bring in, if they're going to be the new Amazon headquarters, or something like this. Because they can provide jobs. And why are jobs important? Well, it still has to do with a growing population. Some of you are parents, some of you are children. But if you're parents, if you think that your kids are not going to be able to find work in your own city, then you're going to have to go somewhere far away to visit your grandkids. And I speak as somebody who has four grandkids who don't live anywhere near me. Anyway, so the big story is the expansion of the American domain. But it's, a, a, it's an expansion that is quite limited in time. And I will add something I alluded to earlier. There was a moment in the 1840s when Americans spoke of this thing they called manifest destiny. It was a really self-serving explanation as to why the United States was and should expand across North America. And it combined, well, it combined the gospel of Christianity with the gospel of democracy. 
And Americans, I'm not going to say all Americans by any means, not all Americans were sort of swayed by their own rhetoric, but plenty of people were, who believed that the United States had figured out how political systems should be organized, and that democracy was the highest form of political development. And I'll stop here to jump a little bit forward. What is the motto of the Center of American History? Hindsight. Turning hindsight into foresight. So we're going from the past to the present and the future. I'm going to ask a question to you. Do you think that democracy is the wave of the future in sort of world political organization? Before you answer, I'm going to point something out. That in the year 1800, there were essentially no functioning democracies in the world. Uh, maybe Switzerland on good days, um, but in terms of large countries, no. Democracy was this odd thing. In fact, democracy was almost a swear word in political discourse because democracies were usually seen as that halfway house down the slippery slope from a republic to anarchy. Because after all, democracy, and by democracy I mean, and people then meant, ordinary people exercising political power. So why should anybody think that ordinary people should be able to exercise political power? I put the question to you, I put the question to my students. Do you think democracy is a good idea in all sorts of things? Suppose, for example, you should have the misfortune of requiring delicate surgery. Well, would you just grab somebody off the street and say, you know, start cutting? No, no. You'd want somebody who was qualified by talent, by education, by experience, and that's what you would insist on. Well, do you think that being governor of Colorado, being president of the United States, being a senator, being a mayor is easier than being a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon? These are very responsible jobs. So in the year 1800, it was perfectly respectable to say democracy is the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. So in 1800, effectively, no democracies. By 1900, the idea was starting to catch on. The United States was really the first large democracy. And I'm going to qualify that and explain what I mean. Not a perfect democracy by any means, but no country to even today is a perfect democracy. But by 1900, there were maybe a dozen to 20 democracies, depending on exactly how you counted them and whether, where we were between uh, coups in various countries around the world. So, that, so we go from basically zero, let's say 20, we'll be generous, in 1900. By the year 2000, the number of functioning democracies was maybe by the count of, there's something called the Center for the Study of Democracy, or something like that, that had them around 120 or 130. So look at that. That trend line's going way up. So now I put the question to you again. Do you think that democracy is the wave of the future in human political organization? Show of hands, please. Yes, if you do. Really? Okay. Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, and, and now for those who say no. Now, I'm not saying pure, but, we'll, but, but functioning democracy. Okay. Something I'm going to call the United States today um, of, a democracy. Okay, so something like that. Again, there are, you know, there are approximations in everything in life. Okay, so we had, it looked like a majority of you said it's not the wave of the future. I, I think I got that, and, and some of you said yes. Okay, anyway, um, well, well, we'll see, maybe over the next 100 years or so, should we live that long. But the reason I say this is that in the 1840s, it was part of the American civic gospel that democracy was the wave of the future and the United States was riding that wave. And furthermore, that it was America's right. No, no, it was America's duty to spread democracy. Because if you believe in it, well then, giving democracy to other countries and peoples is your obligation. And I would add that this idea of spreading democracy 
would have a lot of staying power in American history. In 1917, when Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany, do you, I'm not going to say, do you remember what he said? I, I speak to a continuing education programs at the University of Texas where I teach. And the average age of the audience is maybe 75. And I was speaking some years ago on Benjamin Franklin. And I, I was talking about how the, the stamp at, well, what I, what I meant to say was, well, what I meant to say was, you will remember from your study of American history that the Stamp Act was very controversial in America. What I said was, you will remember that the Stamp Act, and an elderly gentleman in the back stood up and he said, young man, how old do you think we are? <laughs> anyway, you're nowhere near that old. But anyway, you'll recall from your study of American history that Woodrow Wilson justified his, requ his request for declaration of war on grounds that the world needed to be made safe for democracy. Now I'm going to jump almost a century later than that. And most of you, except for the younger students here, will remember this. Do you remember what the fallback justification for the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 was? The original one was Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. But when the weapons of mass destruction never showed up, what was the second version? We have to bring democracy to the Middle East. We have to bring democracy to the Arab world. And that was considered, at least by the people who made the argument, sufficient justification. So this idea that democracy is something that must be shared with the world is really caught on in the United States. Now, this was part and parcel of America's continental expansion in the 1820s, 30s, 40s. But interestingly enough, interestingly enough, there was something, there was an area in which it kind of got pushed back. So, in the 1840s, leading up to the American War with Mexico, that was fought over Texas and over California, with Colorado sort of part of the, the mix, um, there was a school of thought that the United States was going to be a continental republic and that the stars and stripes would wave from the Isthmus of Panama, or the peaks of Darien, as they said in those days, to the polar sea, to the, to the Arctic Ocean. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. The United States spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but the northern border is, you know, 49th parallel, roughly, and the southern border is the Rio Grande. You know why? You want to know why that that expansion I've sort of explained why the expansion occurred in the first place and why it went from coast to coast this way, but why did it not go coast to isthmus to coast that way? It was, in fact, part of the same justification. Why did the United States not take Canada? Why did the United States not take Mexico? Now, in fact, in the 1840s, there was a prospect that the United States actually could have taken Mexico. The U.S. Army was in occupation of Mexico City, and it could almost dictate terms regarding Mexico. But you know why the United States did not take Mexico? Now, this is, I'm going to sort of give you the answer, and it's not going to make the United States sound very good, but, well, sometimes the United States doesn't look very good. The basic reason the United States did not take Mexico was that there are too many Mexicans there. And I say this because, well, when you think about the territory that the United States expanded into as it moved west, it was territory that was not then inhabited by any large number of people in dense populations. The Native American tribes had been largely decimated by the spread of introduced disease. So when Americans moved into the Mississippi Valley, there had been larger populations for that matter. When, the United, when Americans, the first English colonists, moved into New England. New England had been depopulated by disease that had come even before the English got there. And so they were not entirely empty spaces, and there were indeed wars for the plains, and there were wars in California, there were wars in uh, Oregon, there were wars everywhere. But there, the wars were small-scale stuff compared to the wars of Europe, for example. For the first time, American expansionism ran up against a large population 
was when American troops got to the Valley of Mexico, the Mexico City, and there are lots of people there. And they made very clear they did not want to be part of the United States. And if you believe in the democratic ethos, the basis of democracy is that people get the government they want. And Americans couldn't quite bring themselves to say, we are going to force you kicking and screaming into our democracy. So democracy was the force that drove America west, but it also was the force that caused America to stop. It's a little bit more complicated than this. There was some concern that if Mexico were brought into the Union, then much of Mexico would become slave states, and this was something that the North wasn't going to tolerate. But the, the fundamental problem was, that fundamental problem for those continental expansionists was, that there were all these people who objected to being part of the United States, and you cannot be a good Democrat and force people into your domain. Anyway, so there's that aspect of it. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and look at and, and examine how this looks from the perspective of American politics and sort of the political emergence of democracy, because I just talked as though democracy just kind of happened. But democracy didn't just happen. The United States was not born a democracy. The Constitution of the United States, the one we've been living under since 1789, did not envision democracy. In fact, it's a constitution almost written against democracy, which is why we have a Senate. A Senate is a really undemocratic thing, especially the Senate as it was originally devised. You will recall from your study of the Constitution. <laughs> no, I remember. There you go. From your study of the Constitution, that senators were not chosen by the people. They were chosen by state legislatures because the people could not be trusted to make these wise decisions. You had to have this sort of filter of the popular voice. This is why we still have an electoral college. The electoral college originally was set up so that the electors would be people, they were almost like a screening committee. And the electors were expected to use their own judgment. They were not forced to vote the way their state had voted. Oh, that's because most electors were not even chosen by popular vote. In the early days, most electors were chosen by state legislatures as well. What did ordinary people know about making political decisions? Some of you will remember this from your own experience. In the contested election of 2000, when the outcome of the election hinged on a recount in Florida, which way was Florida going to go? If Florida went for Al Gore, Al Gore would be president. If it went for George W. Bush, George W. Bush would win. And there was a moment when, well, Bush was leading, and then this was stopped, and the Republicans, well, naturally wanting their guy to win, wanted to do whatever they could to make sure that they won Florida. But the recount looked like it might tip the balance in favor of the Democratic candidate, Al Gore. And in the middle of this, when it was wending its way through the courts, the Republican Secretary of State of Florida picked up her pocket constitution. And she looked in there and said, you know what? Do you know how electors are chosen? By the states. That's all the constitution says. The states shall choose electors. You know what? We could have the Florida legislature Choose the electors of Florida. We could short circuit this whole, con this, this whole judicial thing. And apparently, the, oh, I, and she knew that Republicans controlled the Florida legislature. So they would naturally choose Republican electors and George W. Bush would get elected. She realized this would not go over too well, but it, so it was shelled. But the point is that this country was not a democracy at its birth. And it was not expected that ordinary people would actually exercise political power. It was a republic from its birth. And a republic is, well, it comes from the Latin phrase, res publica, the things of the people. But it's really vague on the role of the people. Legitimacy, political legitimacy, comes from the people rather than from God, for example, or from some king or dynastic family. So it's different in that regard. And the 
people who live in a republic are citizens rather than subjects, so that part was agreed upon. But this idea that ordinary people should actually exercise political power, no, no. In the 1790s, very few people could vote, even in the elections where they could actually vote. I mean, leave aside senatorial elections where they couldn't vote and presidential elections where they couldn't vote, but even voting for governor or members of Congress. You had to own property and a substantial amount of property, and you had to have been long time in residence where you were. And this because there was a belief that you needed to have some skin in the game. The principal thing that governments did then was to tax people. And if you didn't have anything to tax, then you could be the most irresponsible sort of voter. It took a while for the idea that ordinary people should actually be able to vote to take hold. And do you know where that idea came from? And do you know why it took hold? It came from the West. Democracy, American democracy, was born in the American West. How so? Well, in places like Ohio, which was the first state formed out of the Northwest Territory, in places like Kentucky, peeled off, Kentucky was originally the western part of Virginia. Tennessee was originally the western part of North Carolina. When these new states entered the Union, they were competing with each other and with old states for people. Why did they want people? Why did the new states want people? Well, they wanted people because until you had 60,000 people, you couldn't even be a state. So you had to attract people. There's another. There's a deeper reason. Why, well, why states and cities still want people? And it has to do with the single form of economic activity that is responsible for more fortunes in American history than any other. How have more American fortunes been made than by any other means? Land development. You buy land cheap, the land price goes up, you make money. And how do you do that? You go west, you buy some land, you get it really cheap, and then the population wherever you went grows, there's more demand for it, the price of your land goes up, and you're rich. So this idea of attracting people, and it's not just land, it's also anybody who opens a store. You want business. You become a lawyer. You need clients and all this stuff. So people, governments, businesses, they like to attract people. So what would prompt somebody to move to Tennessee rather than Kentucky? Or move to Santa Tennessee, for example, rather than stay in North Carolina? What, well, I'll ask you, what do, what do governments do these days to entice businesses, to entice enterprise? What do they do? They offer tax breaks. They give them some kind of deal. They, ha they basically offer money. They offer a financial incentive. Well, the governments, the state government of Tennessee, the state government of Kentucky, didn't have any money. They got land, right, and they were, the land, well, actually, that's a little bit problematic because they didn't, actually, the states didn't actually own the land. But, but what, what could a state government offer to entice people to come that was free? It didn't cost them anything. Well, what they offered was full citizenship, full voting rights. You stay in Virginia, you sucker, and you're never going to get to vote. Move to Kentucky, and you'll get to vote. And this was intriguing. This was something that, it was a time when America was trying to figure out what its identity was, and all of a sudden, you can be a full participating citizen. Just come to our state. So the western states were the first ones to drop the property requirements, the first ones to drop the long residency requirements. And interestingly enough, this democratic imperative, it backwashed into the old states. Why? Because they were losing the population to the new territories. And so this idea that ordinary people should be able to vote, it was essentially a bribe to get people to come. Well, yeah, it was, it was, it was a bribe, but it was also it was also a playing out of, I'll ask another quiz question, the most famous and consequential sentence ever 
written in American history. It consists of five words. And it's in one of America's two founding charters. I'll give you a hint. The two charters are the Constitution, of which I've spoken, and the Declaration of Independence. So what the most potent five words perhaps ever written by any American? All men are created equal. And when Jefferson wrote it in 1776, it was kind of a throwaway line. He was clearing his throat to get along and ran to his indictment of George III. But words have power. You put them out there, and they resonate with people. So this idea, all men are created equal, and then there's this land available, and then there's these governments offering you this stuff. So gradually the idea of democracy took hold, and it spread from west to east. But at the same time, it also shaped the development of the west. Democracy became the model of American politics and political participation. Roughly between 1820 and 1850, or thereabouts. Now, when I say democracy, I'm saying that it's based on the idea, the principle, that ordinary people get to exercise political power. Not all the ordinary people, but a big group more than was the case before. By the 1820s, nearly all adult, essentially, all adult white males in America could vote. Now, adult white male, I mean, th those are restrictions. But still, the electorate was much broader than it had been, probably five or six times larger than it had been in the 1790s. And the principle was there. Ordinary people get to vote. Now, the next big expansion would be with the 15th Amendment that guaranteed that black males could vote, more precisely, that the vote could not be restricted on account of race or condition of, previous condition of servitude. Uh, so that's the 15th Amendment. It was honored more in the breach than the observance in large parts of the country for the next 80 years. And then the next big expansion would be in 1920, when the vote is given to women. And the next big expansion, the early 1970s, when the vote is lowered to 18. Are there any, some of you who are, we were talking before, you don't get an answer. Um, are there any large groups of the American electorate that still can't vote? I mean, sorry, they're not part of the electorate. Of the American population that still can't vote? Or have we reached, what shall I say, peak democracy? Who can't vote still? Okay, uh, convicted felons in most states can't vote, but there's a much larger group than that. Uh, Non-citizens, but we're, I guess, still got a much larger group than that. Uh, Native Americans can vote. Uh, children, there you go, people who are under 18. And, I mean, I, so when I get this laugh, and I get the laugh a lot, but I will just point out to you, if somebody had said in the year 1890, should women get the vote? No. There would have been a lot of people who would have been laughing there too, you know? Should African Americans get the vote? If I'd asked the question in 1840, you've got to be kidding. And so these attitudes change. But this emergence of democracy greatly complicated American politics as it related to the West. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly because I do want to leave time for questions. But the overriding question of American politics from the 1820s to the 1860s. The overriding, the most controversial question, the one that threatened to blow up the Union. What was the question? Slavery. What are we going to do about slavery? In the first place, can slavery exist within a democracy? If you have this political system that's based on the statement, the principle that all men are created equal, what do you do about democracy? Which very clearly, these people are not equal. Can this persist? But then there's the next question is, how do we organize this new West? Yes, by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, new states will be created out of this Western territory, but what kind of states? In 1787, nobody much worried about it. In fact, the Northwest Ordinance mandated that there should be no slavery in the Ohio Territory, the Northwest Territory. That's why the sort of Northwestern part of the country was free. And in fact, nobody much worried about it because almost everybody in the 1780s thought that slavery was on its way out. Clearly, slavery was dying in the North. Why was it dying in the North? Because Northerners had a fit of morality? No, because their economies had outgrown slavery. They, they got onto the modernizing train sooner. And 
A modern economy, an industrial economy, requires a flexible workforce. And slavery is many things, but it's a very inflexible kind of workforce. So the question, well, in fact, the reason the Constitution allowed slavery to continue to exist was, first of all, they couldn't figure out how to get southern states to ratify the Constitution if they didn't, but secondly, because everybody thought it's just going to go away. It had gone away in the North without any big deal. It was going to go away in the South, too. But things changed. The cotton gin was invented. And really fertile soil on the western part of the Old West, or the southern part of the Old West, developed. But, so democracy had to grapple with what do we do about slavery? And what democracy did for a while, successfully, was to compromise on the issue. Now, when I talk about this with modern audiences, uh, many people are very unhappy with the idea, how can you compromise with slavery? Slavery is simply wrong. And any compromise with slavery is to be complicit in that great evil. But I put the question to you, and I put the question to those, these objectors. Well, what was the alternative? Because the Constitution basically guaranteed slavery's right to exist. Slavery was legal. It was constitutional. And there was nothing in the world that could make Virginia or Georgia or Alabama give up slavery. Oh, you could argue. Sure, if the North could have marched an army into Georgia, eventually or the North did march an army into Georgia, but it wasn't originally, it wasn't to free the slaves. There was no support, well, really small amount of support in the North for any kind of military effort to free the slaves. When John Brown launched his war against slavery at Harper's Ferry in 1859, Northerners were as appalled as Southerners. So slavery existed, but how could it be constrained? How could it be, well, contained to use a term from the Cold War? So it was by a series of compromises. The first compromise was the so-called Missouri Compromise, which kept slavery out of the northern part of that, that west, of the, the western half of the Mississippi Valley. And that seemed to hold, and that seemed to be a start on sort of basically reining slavery in, eventually leading to slavery's own self-demise. The next, well, the, the big compromise, the next big compromise was the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 seemed to be about slavery, but the Compromise of 1850 was something that nobody had seen coming. In fact, the Compromise of 1850 was triggered by, was compelled by, one of the great, and I'll call it one of the great accidents of history. Accident in the sense that before it happened, no one saw it coming, unlike, say, the Industrial Revolution. People saw the Industrial Revolution coming from a long ways away. The thing that I'm talking about, this is the biggest single event in Western history, Western American history. It's the biggest single event in, I'm going to argue, it's the big, biggest single event in American history in the first half of the 19th century. I'm going to make an even more extravagant claim. I'm going to say that it is the first big event in world history. Do you know what I'm talking about? California the discovery of gold in California. It was an accident in the sense that on January 23rd, 1849, neither James Marshall nor John Sutter nor anybody had any idea that there was gold in California. On January 24th, the gold was discovered. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Why? The territory that was just about, well, had been taken from Mexico in the Mexican War, everybody thought that it would take as long to fill up with people as the Louisiana Purchase had taken to fill up. And half a century after its acquisition, most of the Louisiana Purchase was still empty. And California was even farther away. And there wasn't anything to attract people there. And so it was thought that, all right, we'll have half a century to figure out what to do about slavery there. You know, we've got this compromise from the 1820s. It's still going. Then gold is discovered. And all of a sudden, California fills up with people and demands admission into the Union. This is part of that Northwest Ordinance 1787, the whole principle that the Western territories can become states when they get enough people. So California has to be admitted. And Californians, with no authorization from anybody, wrote a constitution. 
And the Constitution said no slavery in California. And they sent the Constitution back to their Constitution, back to Washington, said, let us in. And we're going to be admitted as a free state. And the South said, no, you're not. In fact, the South objected quite vigorously. But American democracy, in its wisdom and in that state, came up with a compromise. And the compromise was California gets admitted as a free state. This is a big deal because it tipped the balance in Congress against the slave states. The free states now had a majority in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate. The South is going to get a quid pro quo. What does it get? It gets a new, stiffer, fugitive slave law that basically put teeth into that clause of the Constitution that says that if a slave escapes from one state into another state, then authorities in that other state have to help return the slave. This outraged many Northerners because the North now would become complicit, we be forced to be complicit in the return of slaves. The South thought that, that that gave it only as much as it deserved, and they were outraged by the admission of California as a free state. The Compromise of 1850 really didn't satisfy anybody. It simply ratcheted up tensions, and 10 years later, South Carolina, after the election of Abraham Lincoln, the first Westerner to be elected president, real Westerner to be elected president, um, the first Republican of the modern Republican era to be elected president. When he gets elected, South Carolina and six other southern states immediately leave the Union. And, well, the Civil War came. But you know why the Civil War came? It wasn't because, it wasn't entirely because it was North versus South. The West, having triggered this whole thing, also was essential in the thinking of Abraham Lincoln in what to do about secession. Because Lincoln could have said to South Carolina and the United States, well, we think you're foolish for doing this, and we wish you wouldn't, but, okay, you've done it, and there you go. Just go in peace. But he didn't. And you know why Abraham Lincoln did not allow the South to secede in peace? You might think it had to do with North versus South. Well, that was part of it. But it had everything to do with the West. Why the West? Because... Well, in fact, here's a thought experiment for you, and then I'm going to end on this, and we'll have time for questions. So, if secession had remained confined to the territories in the southeastern United States, if the, if the seceded states had stopped east of the Mississippi River, stopped at, say, Mississippi, then Lincoln would not have had such an incentive, such a compulsion to suppress secession by military force. But when secession leaped the Mississippi River, you know what that meant? If he had not contested, if he had allowed Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana to leave the Union uncontested, it meant that the single most important transportation artery in the United States, the river that controlled the entire center of the country, would be flowing through foreign territory. And Abraham Lincoln simply could not allow that. This was why Benjamin Franklin had negotiated so hard for the eastern bank of the Mississippi River at Paris in the 1780s. It's why Thomas Jefferson purchased Louisiana. Really, he was just trying to buy New Orleans. And uh, Napoleon started throwing the rest of it. The control of the Mississippi River was absolutely essential for the future of the United States, who controlled the Mississippi, would control the American heartland. And if Lincoln had let it go, then the American heartland would have been controlled by this foreign country, and he simply could not let that happen. Okay, I hope I've given you something to think about, something to ask questions about, something to argue about. Please, questions. Yes, sir. You gave a, a reason why we did not uh, invade and take over Mexico, but you didn't go back to indicating why we did not, what the reason was that we didn't go north. Aha, thank you for asking that question. This was one of the most brilliant moves in the history of British imperialism, which didn't include very many brilliant moves. There are a lot of stupid moves in the history of British imperialism. But the smartest move to keep Canada within the empire was to give Canada independence. Not quite. Give Canada home rule. Because until 1867, which is when Canada got home rule, Americans could say, we will liberate Canada. The Canadians didn't want liberating at the hands of the United States. America invaded Canada, tried to get Canada in the Revolutionary War, 
tried it three times during the War of 1812. There were various raids into Canada in the 1830s and 1840s. And every time the Canadians said, forget it, we don't want this. But Americans could still fool themselves into thinking, we are going to bring self-government to the Canadians. Well, what the British did is said, we're giving self-government to the Canadians. And at that point, all of this American agitation for Canada simply ceased. Because in good conscience, a democracy could not seize foreign territory, especially when there were people who were very much like the United States and spoke the English language and all this other stuff. So Canada got democracy sort of ahead of having to get it at the hands of the United States. Other questions, comments, reactions? How about from some of the students? There we go. Okay, well, you first and then you. Yes. Well, first of all, the, expansion, the American expansion of the West outpaced population. And so from the Louisiana Purchase, uh, they, so the first acquisition of new territory post-Revolutionary War. So um, at the time of the Revolutionary War, all the land east of the Mississippi River was claimed by existing states. Now, eventually, the states gave up those claims, not all of them, so Tennessee, North Carolina never gave up its claims. It just split off Tennessee. But um, once you get across the Mississippi River into what I could call the modern American West, the trans-Mississippi West, that was land that was federal land before there were any states there. And so it's land where there essentially was no pre-existing population that's going to be easily integrated into the United States. Yes, there are Native American tribes there. And in parts of Louisiana, what would become the state of Louisiana, there were French speakers and Spanish and so on. But this was all federal land. And the land then would be apportioned out to first federal territories and then states. So it, the land came first. It was acquired by the government basically back in Washington. As it filled up with people, then it adopted these democratic norms and democratic forms of government. Does that answer your question? A little bit, yeah. Okay, and maybe I'll circle back to it. You had a question. Yeah. Good question. So if you don't mind, I will sort of uh, characterize those two different versions a little bit differently. And that is so you can have governments that are able to get stuff done, and that will use a Chinese model. But it, it basically any kind of autocracy, where there are a few people making decisions, and the, de the decisions are imposed from the top down. So that's one model. We'll call it the autocratic or the authoritarian model. Then there's a democratic model where the decisions tend to well up more from the, the bottom up. Not entirely, but and, and no government is either all one or all the other. But here I will ask you if you remember from your reading, some of you perhaps from recalling when it was spoken. Do you know what Winston Churchill said about democracy? In spite of the fact that democracy is the worst form of government, it's the best of there is in the world. Yeah, so, so Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government there is, except for everything else that has been tried, which is really sort of, uh, what, praising with faint damn or damning with faint praise or something like that. So I will ask you, what is it that accounts for the appeal of democracy? What does democracy have going for it? Is it its efficiency? that is able to get, get stuff done in a timely manner? And the answer is no. In fact, even democracies become less democratic during times of emergency. 
And President Trump is using this model to get his wall built. And he's declaring the national emergency. And this is built on the precedence of national emergencies that have been declared in many other cases, where there's a hurricane. Or the, the obvious case of national emergency is war. And in wartime, presidents get a lot more power than they have during peacetime. In some cases, they get it by statute. Very often, they just take it and use it. So Abraham Lincoln, in, when he was elected in 1860, he said again and again, I will not take action against slavery in the states where it exists. I don't believe I have the authority to do so, and I do not have the inclination to do so. Comes the Civil War, and there's the Emancipation Proclamation, there's the end of slavery. So war makes all things possible. In, if you go back to the days of the Roman Republic, Rome was a republic, not a democracy, but a republic. But Rome had this clause in its operative constitution that allowed for the election of a dictator. And when the security of the Roman Republic was at stake, when the Carthaginians were at the gates, they would elect a dictator. And this one person had the power literally of life and death over everybody in the Republic. It was term limited. You only had six months to be a dictator. So even democracies recognize that sometimes democracy is a slow way of doing things. So if democracy is not efficient at getting stuff done, if it's, it can't get things done in a timely fashion, what does democracy have to say for itself that no other form of government can say for itself in such a thoroughgoing way? Democracy has legitimacy. And that is you, everybody, every voter gets a chance to participate in the decision. And so if you don't, if the decision doesn't go your way, it's because you were outnumbered. It's not that you weren't consulted. Lots of times people could complain about forms of government when they're not represented. What was the slogan of the American Revolution? No taxation without representation. By the way, you know what the British offered in response to that? You want representation? We'll give you representation. In fact, it turns out the Americans just didn't want the taxation. So they backed up really quickly. No, 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 no. So, so this is the thing that democracy has going for it. And the, one of the reasons that there's been this spread of democracy is the 20th century was the age of the emergence of what shall I call the common man and woman. The idea that there weren't people who were simply destined to be subordinate to other people. This was, this was the corrosion of empires. And when a country like India, when Indians would realize, you know what, we don't have to be subordinate to the British. And what would become the 54 countries of Africa, when they decided we don't, we don't have to be colonies. The, the Second World War was this crucial moment when people sort of awoke to, awoke to what? Well, Thomas Jefferson's five words, all men are created equal. Not all of them got them directly from Jefferson, although it's striking how many of these newly independent countries in the 1950s and 1960s borrowed, plagiarized, or stole from the U.S. Constitution. You perhaps have heard about Ho Chi Minh at the end of World War II asked the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, if they would give him a copy of the U.S. Constitution. He wanted to write a Declaration of Independence for Vietnam. So, I don't know uh, whether democracy is the wave of the future. I don't know if in this aspect history is linear or if it's cyclical. Will, will, there, will there be this wave in favor of democracy? And will the wave peak? And then will there be ups and downs in the democratic cycle? I will say that I said in 1800, 1900, 2000, by many measures, the world is less democratic today than it was 19 years ago. And one of the test cases for this was and is China. So China really had no history of democracy. But there was a belief among very many people in the West, including in the United States, including in the national security bureaucracy of the United States, that as China develops economically, it will develop democratically as well. Because in the history of the West, the two, economic modernization and political modernization in a democratic direction, always seemed to go together. Sometimes one was ahead of the other, but, but there was no case of a country that developed economically that didn't also develop democratically. And so there was this belief, and it was one of the reasons that the US government basically assisted China's economic development, allowed China to trade on favorable terms to China, brought China into the World Trade Organization, and basically encouraged China's economic growth, even though China was still a one-party state. 
and it was still communist by politics, although by no means socialist anymore in economics. It was a belief that modernization, the development of, of middle class, would force the communist system to change in a democratic way. And it, from the 1970s, when the Chinese economic reforms began, uh, for the next 30 years, it was kind of a, a, a step back with the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, but there were still hopes in the 1990s and the early 2000s that things were moving in that direction. But since the accession of the current president, things have been going in the opposite direction. And there's been backsliding in a number of other countries. Russia, in the 10 years after the demise of the Soviet Union, seemed to be approximately a democracy. Uh, Russia is nothing like a democracy today. So it raises this question. Is democracy the wave of the future? I don't know. And it's an interesting question here, in the context of what we've been talking about, and maybe I should end on this, that American democracy emerged in the context of this settlement expansion into the West. So if countries don't have this area to expand into, to you know, sort of try out these institutions, does that make them less likely to become democratic? If the United States had to start all over again today, and it was kind of a coin flip, whether it's going to be democratic or something else, in the absence of this territory to expand into, would the United States develop a democracy itself? I don't know the answer to this question. This is, this is uh, what historians get to argue about. And when we figure it all out, then hindsight will become foresight. There we go. Thank you very much.